Hey everybody, thanks for joining me for this video. Uh, you know, I, I haven't put up too much on this channel lately. It's been kind of swamped with the uh, regular uh, freelance work. I'm doing plus the new channel we launched, the Shoe Meander. Um, but I'm still going to try and keep content on here. Uh, basically stuff that doesn't fit quite so well on the, the new channel. That's we try to keep those short and fun. And so I'll try and put more detailed informational videos on here on this channel. Uh, philosophical type things, how-to things and some travel things that people have asked for on this channel from Ask Me to Continue. So this is the January Q&A. I have one left over from December that I'm going to include here. And this is the January Q&A. I should have done the first weekend of January, and here it is. January is almost over, so I figured I'd better hurry up and get to it. So uh, from December, I had a question from uh, Cajun uh, Jamis. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Robert, where do you have residence? You might have answered this already. Why and what are the advantages for you? I am currently based out of Wyoming. Um, there are some advantages to Wyoming. Uh, for example, uh, no state income tax. Uh, um, there's also no vehicle inspections. Uh, and vehicle insurance is fairly cheap here because there's only like half a million people in the state. And it's a pretty big state, so it'll, it'll, uh, it's very rural. So you're more likely to hit uh, uh, antelope or something than you are another person probably. So, um, so the insurance is fairly cheap. Uh, disadvantages, you know, it does have a uh, sales tax, vehicle registration fees are kind of high, uh, even for an older vehicle, they're, they're higher than a lot of other states. Um, but, you know, the, the reason I am in Wyoming is because I actually was here when I hit the road. Uh, my daughter brought me down to be a nanny for a couple of grandkids for a while uh, from Montana. You know, I came down, so that's why I am based out of here. Uh, it really was just that. It wasn't like an on-purpose thing. Um, it just was something I chose to continue. It's not the easiest state to get your residency set up in. This is one of the things. And another problem here is that they there just are no uh, mail forwarders other than uh, those that cater to businesses. So that's kind of a, uh, you know, it makes it really not ideal in some ways. Well, it could be an ideal state for, uh, they, they could be right up there in the top couple for, uh, like South Dakota is, but they just have chosen to uh, go a different direction with some of the regulations that aren't very nomad friendly. So I'm um, here for now. I will eventually do something different. I, I basically have addresses in like three states as it is, but, but I'm here for now. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to the January questions. Mark Busha asked, uh, asked uh, uh, I know you're working so different than our situation, but how long do you stay in a given spot? Do you get the itch to move on? The can't, uh, this came to mind with the current enforcement of the 14-day limit in uh, Ehrenberg for myself. Not sure if I could spend 14 days in one location. Uh, good question, Mark. Um, I, I have spent 14 days in one place, but not often. Uh, usually I move sooner than that. If I'm really like in an area, I may just like I'll... Usually what happens is I'll go to town for groceries or water or gear to trash and then make a change at that point. Uh, so if I really like an area, I may go somewhere, you know, be like three days or seven days in one place and then a few more days or another week somewhere close by that's in the same area but a little bit different view and things. Um, Ehrenberg I've spent a little more time in in the past, but, you know, just because it makes a good winter home base, kind of come and go to different places from. But generally, yeah, after after a f anywhere from three days to a week, I'm getting itchy and looking to move on. And the other thing is that I really try and be uh, respectful of the land where I'm camped. And in my experience, uh, and there's exceptions. Ehrenberg is one of them, for example, or Quartzsikes is so rocky. But most places, the ground starts getting trampled down. You're leaving footpaths, vegetation is getting trampled. And it's starting to look like is is being used and 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 since I'm often dispersed camping, that's my sign that it's time to move. And that usually happens well before two weeks. And once it starts looking like the, the the site's showing signs of use, I try and move on, so that I'm not leaving an impact or as minimal of an impact as possible. Uh, but yeah, usually three to seven days, and I'm kind of like you know <laughs> looking to change the scenery. Hey, Ram Van asked a few questions. If you could pick only one word, your favorite campsite, and why? Uh, one of my longtime favorites, it's hard for me to pick just one, but one of my longtime favorites is up in Sedona, uh, or between Sedona and Cotton, one of 525. That's really nice. Uh, it's just the red rocks is the thing, and the way that they change as the light goes across them during the day, just fantastic. Um, I really enjoy Utah this fall. We had a good camp spot there, but it wasn't, um, well, we were in a couple places there, but it wasn't... Uh, 
outstanding by itself, but the, but it was good, and, and, and the places we were able to see were outstanding. Um, I camped a couple places in Colorado this fall that were just about mind blowing, uh, like up along Moldus Pass and uh, by Silverton. Um, that was really wild, but we were a little bit uh, late in the year, so it was getting pretty cold. So I ended up going down to a lower elevation. But that that's going to rank up as one of my favorites. Um, and there's some spots up in the Bighorns I'm looking forward to camping. I haven't camped yet uh, in Wyoming. So there's a few like that that really stand out as, as memorable. A lot of times, there's, there's a few that are really memorable and a few that are really terrible, and a whole bunch that are kind of like, you know, okay. Uh, but those ones kind of stand out to me as, as really amazing. Um, Ram Van also asked, what item in your van do you use most often, excluding clothes and hygiene items? For me, it's going to be like my laptop and my phone because I, I, they're my work tools, so I use them a lot, uh, and a camera, of course. Um, outside of that, probably like my stove and pots, you know, cookware, because I, I obviously cook uh, once or twice a day, most days. So uh, those are probably the things I use most often that are most valuable to me in terms of, uh, you know, regular use. Uh, what was the first item you discarded, found to not be used, slash needed after you started vanning? Uh, actually, I started out in a Toyota Camry, and the first thing that had to go was my multi-purpose bucket that I thought I was going to be able to use uh, for various uh, necessities. <laughs> Turns out it was too big. I needed something way smaller in a car. So that had to go. That was the first thing. That was a real challenge, figuring out how to take care of that in the, in the car. Um, what food items do you consider to be essential to have in your van home? I try and focus on, I'm getting away from canned goods, but I try and focus on uh, um, non-perishable uh, staple items like quinoa and black beans and legume, uh, or uh, 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 like various legumes, um, flour, things that I can make stuff out of, uh, you know, and then vegetables and, and things like that. Uh, if I'm camped with Deborah, I sometimes stick some meat in her refrigerator because I don't have refrigeration. Uh, I'm trying to get away from the canned meat and stuff. Uh, so I, I just stick with the staples, then I can make anything from that. Hey, Lori Smith says, uh, instead of a cargo trailer as I had planned, I'm looking at living out of my Suburban. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who's living in a very small footprint, what would it be? There's a few things I'll say, but as far as my number one piece of advice, and everything kind of relates to it, is think like a backpacker. And think of your uh, vehicle, SUV, whatever it is, as a uh, metal and glass tent. Uh, and if you think about it that way, it really changes the way you think about what you need for gear, what you're going to bring. Uh, so you think about a backpacker, you know, somebody's hiking the Appalachian Trail, for example, or, or the Arizona Trail, or any of these long distance ones, right? They're carrying everything in their backpack, including a tent usually, and they're just resupplying uh, for food and water along the way. And so if you think about it that way, then it helps put it in perspective. Uh, and so otherwise, if you try and think, you're, if you're thinking like, I need to take my apartment and fit it into, make, turn my SUV or my van into a mini apartment, you're gonna probably end up being frustrating because that's, that's a lot of, you know, that's a hard fit, right? So if you think like a backpacker, um, then you've got, basically you have a luxurious tent is what it comes down to. Um, so within that, expanding on that idea a little bit, uh, obviously, minimizing down to the essentials is uh, critical, and then uh, things like organization is really important. Uh, well, you can do that with duffel bags, you can do it with plastic bins, you can do it with plastic drawer units, you can do it with wooden shelves you build. It doesn't matter whatever you know, whatever works for you and your vehicle, but organization is really important so you can find stuff. Otherwise, it is super easy to lose things, even in a tiny space like a SUV or a minivan, and you'll just always be losing stuff. Um, so the organization and storage, you know, it, it really is a very important part of, for me, is a very important part of uh, making it work and not make yourself too crazy. Um, and then uh, I, I like to think of, uh, if I'm, especially on a smaller vehicle, I like to think of it as a, uh, a place to retreat to, to store things, to sleep, and to, you know, maybe do some work if I need to be on my laptop or something. But otherwise, I try and spend as much time outdoors as I can. And that, that, is reflected in the places that I camp and spend time as well. Because if I'm thinking uh, it's going to, um, the weather's going to be bad, I'm going to want to go somewhere where I, the, the weather's better so I can be outside more. 
Okay, Poppy Good asks, thank you so much, Robert. When I get a minivan, I would like to discard my stow-and-go seats so I will have more storage. Would you know where, how do I dispose of them? Would you suggest selling the seats on Craigslist and van Facebook pages if allowed? If it gets to that point, do you think the vehicle will be able to sell later without them or maybe near a van community? Um, my minivan came without the seats, so I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, when I had my camera I started out in, I would like to have removed the seats, but I knew I was going to be getting rid of it as soon as possible, so I didn't want to, and particularly in a car, I didn't want to take the hit on uh, value, the depreciation of the value, and uh, uh, I didn't want to store them because I was a long ways away from where I'd be storing them, and then I was afraid they'd be damaged in storage and stuff. I do know people who have, with many vans who have stolen those seats who have removed the seats because they can use those that extra space uh, for storage for other things. Uh, so that, that can be a real good reason to do that. Um, yeah, as far as getting rid of them, I would think uh, you should be able to sell them. Uh, hopefully, I don't know how much they'll bring. Um, you can store them, but then you're paying storage for months or years, and you have to hope that they're not actually damaged while they're in storage from rodents or flood or, you know, whatever like that. So uh, I, I would, I guess you have to balance it against you'll probably take a hit on uh, resale value when you do sell it but how much is it going to cost you to store them if you take them out and store them or how much value you are going to get out of uh, having the extra space for storage so it, it just comes down to if it's worth it to you if you're able to remove them and get rid of them that 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 probably will give you some great extra storage uh, for things you don't use all the time uh, and to keep it down low and that, that could be really handy um, but you know it Otherwise, um, you know, yeah, you can always, if, if, you, if, if it's too much of a concern for you, you can always leave them in for a while, see if you can get by without that storage, and if you really feel like you need to remove them at a later point, uh, you can, you know, um, and then you and gain yourself some more storage at that point, but um, you can find, sometimes find people who want to buy a van who don't care about the seats, they're looking for it for a utility vehicle anyways, so they may not care much, uh, but it would seem like that would, that would potentially impact the resale price. Um, so the, uh, again, the, uh, the age of the vehicle, I think, would factor in. Mine's a 2003 and has almost a quarter million miles on it. So, I mean, the, the price difference, the value difference just isn't going to be that, that much on my vehicle. But if it's a newer vehicle, you know, it, it could be more of a concern. So um, that's my uh, take on this stuff, everyone. Uh, I probably won't. Maybe I'll try a, a Q&A for March because it's almost February already. Uh, I do have a few other things coming up pretty soon, hopefully. Like, uh, I got a couple of videos I want to still publish to wrap up the series on Income on the Road. I got a few other things that, that, uh, that I'll definitely be putting on this channel. Thanks for joining me today, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video.